Thank you so much for your patience, and I apologize for my tardiness. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Okay, let's do a roll call, Ryan. Uh, Senator Dina Barrow. Thank you, Ryan. Um, I'd just like to mention, if you're a uh, committee member or commission member, please reintroduce yourself when you make your first comment to the group, just so we can all, I know we have some name tags, but um, just say your name as well as who you represent. Um, as well as, I know we have a few new faces around the table. If anyone, if this is their first commission meeting, can you please introduce yourself right now? Melissa McConnell, I serve in the Louisiana Department of Education on the academic content team supporting students with disabilities age three through five part Welcome, Melissa. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Libby Sarmineto with the Louisiana Policy Institute for Children. Welcome. Okay, that's it. Um, I'd like to mention public comment will be given at the end of the meeting on agenda number six. To give public comment, please complete a public comment card, shown here, and turn it in at the staff table. Public comment is two minutes per individual or five minutes for a group. Um, I'd like to make a motion to receive the minutes from the January 29th, 2019 minute. Okay. Now I'd like to make a motion to receive information, um, consideration of a report on year one of the Early Childhood Care and Education Commission. Today will 
I hope, achieve the objective of bringing this group and the broader audience up to speed on what has happened since we last met. There has been a lot. You may have seen an article or two from our dear friend in the back over here. And um, a lot of discussion, a lot of debate, a lot of legislative and gubernatorial action on the topic of early childhood. We also just have more results and data about our system to talk about. So I want to use today to get us all on the same page about current state of play, what has occurred over the past six months, and then tee up what the work that we will do in the uh, second and final year of this commission to follow up on the year two objectives that you all laid out last year. So this commission, for those who were not involved last year, is a two-year commission focused on access to quality early childhood birth to five. Last year we met, I believe, four or five times and pulled together a report, which is called LAB to three, that talks about um, and quantifies the need for children um, birth to five, but in particular highlighted a great need in serving children birth to three, particularly those from families in need. It lays out um, the dollars needed for that, the size of that challenge, as well as some other areas of work that both have happened and or need to happen in order to build a more robust system of early childhood all across the state of Louisiana. So we'll, we'll touch on both sort of the money and students serve, but we will also talk to you about some of the programmatic advancements that we have made since we last met at your direction and about which we're very pleased to see progress moving. So eager to have that discussion. Um, I'll tell you at the outset, uh, there's a decent amount of information in the presentation today. I hope that this is a dialogue, not just me talking at you all. That sounds terrible for me and for you. So please feel free to jump in as you have questions, reactions, clarifications as we go. Um, and we'll discuss at a few points throughout it, uh, the commission's reactions to various points. Good. Great. Okay. So we're going to start by actually taking a step up, essentially, from the LAB to 3 report last year and talking about the state of play. So as you know, in Louisiana, as we discussed extensively last year and as is rated number eight in the entire country for early childhood, about to be very proud, uh, we have a quality rating system that produces what we call performance profiles for every site that is publicly funded in this state. That means we have information down to the classroom level for all ages of children served, whether they are publicly funded or not, in a center that has even one publicly funded child. All of that is available on louisianaschools.com. We call it our school and center finder. <clears throat> but that information is also used to highlight centers, head starts, and schools that are doing exceptional work. And as we'll discuss, for us to lean in and support more heavily, site centers and head starts that are struggling as well. Um, we have good data to show there that I'm really excited to talk about also. But this is sort of the system that underlies this whole maze of work together. So as we discussed extensively last year, there was a lot of debate about the money that is needed and the kids that need service. But all of those dollars are being asked for and requested against a system that itself has proven it can produce quality it can improve that quality year over year, and it can help those who are most struggling improve at scale. So it is a robust and quality system. It is about expanding the access to that system as much as it is about improving the system itself at this point. And I think it's a really important point to understand. It's not as if this is a, an ask for fund LAB to three and then we'll get better. It is to say we have a system that certainly has places to improve, but is all in all pretty great. The problem is it doesn't have enough dollars in it to serve the children, families, and systems that need that to, that need access. So with that, we'll jump in. Um, our rating system this year will have five levels. The highest of those is excellent. The lowest of those is unsatisfactory. It's on a seven-point scale, which matches against the class tool. And when I say class, I don't mean classroom. It is an acronym, C-L-A-S-S. -S. But it is essentially a tool that is um, extremely highly regarded. It's used all over the world. And it gauges teacher-child interactions so that it's less about, does this three-year-old know exactly what this other three-year-old knows? Of course, developmentally, they might be in different places. 
but it's much more about the adult in the room who can make sure that that moment and every interaction is as age appropriate and developmentally appropriate as it can be in order to have all of our children be more kindergarten ready. Um, it's reliable, we do third party checks. I can talk about any of that that's helpful to the group, but this is um, a system that measures classrooms in every site throughout the year, multiple times, both local and third party observers to arrive at the results you see here today. And what you can see is we are now entering our third year of producing these results statewide. The goal, of course, is to get further to the right on this chart. Um, and we have seen the percentage of excellent and high proficient and proficient sites grow every year, while we have seen the number of unsatisfactory sites go down, as well as approaching proficient sites go down, which is exactly the trend that we want to see. We're still not pleased that there, this is all preliminary, but that preliminarily there are still 15% approaching proficient, but that is a solvable problem. And we are pleased to see the direction of that trend and optimistic about the work we see happening all across the state to address those ongoing challenges. Um, what you see in these data are those same results broken out by provider type. So another important thing to know about the early childhood system in Louisiana is that unlike many states, we don't have a disconnected system of a bunch of providers who don't talk to each other serving kids. We work very hard to make sure that in communities led by community leaders from those areas, many of which are around this table, Head Start, Child Care, and School Pre-K see it as their job to work together to serve all kids. Um, and when we, you know, the, this all started with Act 3 in 2012 and bringing these providers together. When that happened, I think there were a lot of questions about what will it mean for a school to perform against this metric versus child care versus Head Start. And what you see here is um, there are differences between providers on average, but in general, they are roughly around the same area. And most importantly, we see providers of every single type improving. So schools every year improving, Head Starts every year improving, child cares every year improving, all of them within the proficient range at this point, which is extremely exciting to see. When I said earlier that our system has five levels, that is something that's new this year. Last year we only had four, and as you can see on the left bar, the proficient bucket started to get very, very, very big. And we felt good about those cuts, but it is also important that systems of measurement drive incentives and motivations to get better and provide meaningful differentiation for parents and providers where it exists. And it is just true that in the old proficient range, those who were at the very top of that range and those who were scoring at the very bottom of that range represented pretty significantly different experiences um, <coughs> for children. And so we're excited this year, um, our Early Childhood Advisory Council helped shape this to add this additional level, which provides further recognition, incentive, acknowledgement for our sites that are just a step away from being excellent, which is so hard to achieve, um, and provides further incentive and motivation for our proficient sites to keep driving forward as they've been doing year over year. Any questions about this so far? because my love of charts is deep, I'll show you one more. Uh, this shows you uh, the sites and how they're trending year over year. So year to year, most sites on average are going up, and it's usually incremental. You expect this in a very large system on a scale that is reliable. We shouldn't see wild variation year to year, unless, for example, you have a totally different teacher in that classroom. You might see some variance depending on teacher quality. But you can see for most, they're moving within a couple of tenths of a point, which is still pretty significant on a seven point scale. And on the very outliers, you have a very small number of sites that are going way up or way down. And we'll talk about those a little bit as well. <coughs> Perhaps one of the things that I'm most excited to share, if you came to our Teacher Leader Summit this year, uh, you've heard me talk about it there for sure. Um, uh, the team did, many of these wonderful ladies represented at this table back here, uh, in partnership with some of our field staff and most notably in partnership with our sites, our resource and referral centers, and our lead agencies, 
really leaned in with a set of sites, roughly 60 across the state, that were really struggling. So they may not have been so low as to lose their public funding, although some of them were, but they were on the cusp of that and represented an opportunity to just help them build up their practice, build up their skill, make that a more instructionally sound center uh, to support. So any site that was below 3.75 was obligated to go through an improvement planning process. Um, and what we've seen here is that um, the vast, vast majority of these sites improved and at very large scale. So just to point you to the bottom of this, of the participating sites, 95% improved this year compared to only a third of approaching proficient sites that did not participate. Meaning of sites that were roughly scoring the same, when they went into this process and really committed to betterment and worked with coaches and support, we saw significant difference in the likelihood that they were going to improve. Which I mentioned here, I know this is in the weeds for a group that's thinking about overall funding, but I think it's important because what this shows me is we, with relatively large scale, know, and our providers know, and our lead agencies know, and our resource and referral centers know how to start moving the needle. So even when a site is struggling, there are clear indicators and steps to take to help them get better over time, in part because class as a tool has provided such a clear north star in part because it comes with really robust training and supports for all of the educators involved, and in part because our community networks, most of all, have led the charge locally to rally everybody around a, what, a definition of what excellence looks like and to help people get better against that. You see here the specific results of that. So as I mentioned, we had 59, excuse me, not 60 sites. 56 of those sites improved, only three declined and 27 of them improved more than a point, which even if you don't know anything about class on a seven point scale is utterly remarkable. It is, it represents um, notable and significant and really exciting improvement to see and we're incredibly proud of these sites for leaning in and um, stepping up to do uh, better by kids. Any questions about those data before we jump into what this now means for the commission's work and the report in year two? Yes, ma'am. Um, Susan Spring with uh, Regina Chaley, Child Development Center. Uh, so for the three sites that declined, are they still in the process? Have they dropped out? What is their status? I believe one of those sites was closing anyway, the other two will remain in the improvement process. We talk to our field support consultants about their recommendations for the site because we don't want them to lose the improvement that they've already, already achieved. So we are going to continue kind of a modified version of site improvement planning for sites that are recommended to continue the process. I will just say about this process, um, it is not fancy. So what's in also interesting about this process that I sort of mentioned was it was uh, quite simple and I actually think that's part of why it worked. So it was a very basic needs assessment. I hate that phrase because I think it's overused in a lot of ways, but it really just looked at on class, do you know what it is? Have you been trained on it? Do your teachers know what it is? Have they been trained on it? How reliably, you know, really methodical steps of how you would implement. It did the same thing on assessment and on curriculum. And then figuring out where the site had their biggest gaps, laid out some specific but achievable goals with the director to say, okay, in the next three months, we're gonna help you get deeply trained on class. Or we're gonna do a training with all of your teachers to get their familiarity up so they understand the target they're aiming for. It looked different place to place, but it was simple, it was methodical, it was measurable, and I think it made it feel achievable. Many of our sites that we were working with, um, as we'll discuss extensively today, represent some of our sites that are most struggling financially just to keep the doors open. Uh, you'll remember we talked about last year with Louise Stoney, small centers often struggle more. Centers that try to serve children at the youngest ages often struggle more. That puts real financial constraint on them. And yet they're trying to do right by kids and provide a service we know families need. And so we really tried to have that be an inviting and achievable set of steps to move the needle. Um, and again, just really optimistic about where that landed. 
All right, let's jump into your work as reflected in that quality um, data. So you'll remember last year, this group put out a plan, as I mentioned, LA Beta 3, thank you. It quantified all of the children in need, 173,000. It recommended, you all recommended, a roughly $86 million investment per year, cumulative over time, over a 10 year period. But recognizing that was not all state funding, that represented local, philanthropic, state, federal, um, but encouraged a state investment to get the ball rolling as far as closing the massive gap we have in access. And it got a lot of talk. Um, if you read the paper at all during this legislative session, dare I say, there was a 50% chance the headline was going to be about um, the great need in early childhood, which I think, you know, is complicated and frustrating, but was really inspiring to see a state on so many levels um, of different political leanings really talking about a subject that matters so much for our economy, our families, and our kids. It was everywhere. Um, and as a result, uh, we did secure dollars. Um, so we're gonna walk through what those dollars were, what they were for, and frankly, they're all already moving. So I want you to understand where they are in process. We are trying to spend them as soon as we get them, um, as well as the gap that that leaves, both from the plan that you asked and the need that exists. Before I jump into the particulars, yes. one of our courageous champions over here, do you want to offer a thought about yeah. that? Yeah, sure. Um, early ed was, there was a buzz around early ed this session. Um, and I credit that to many of the people in this room who have been tireless advocates for how many years on this issue? Um, but I was hearing it from colleague after colleague, um, championing early ed, understanding the impact, trying to see where they could potentially, um, if, if any of their bills had a funding stream, see if a portion of that could go towards early ed. Um, so I think the roughly 20 million that we saw this year go to early ed is a, is a really good start. Um, it's, I understand it's not where we need to be that all of our birth through four year olds are covered. Um, I think the biggest thing will be making sure that people understand that this is a need that's not a one-time need. <laughs> we, we have more babies being born and we have more children matriculating through that process. And I think as much as we can get people to understand, and this is to me what I think is important, that just as we look at K-12 through funding as being essential and important for our school-aged children, this is just the first step of that. This is where the uh, foundation of the building is being built. This is where all the brain development is occurring. And so getting people to think of that, this not as a, an optional thing that we do one year if it's possible and, and maybe in a few years or something, uh, we would never think of, of looking at our MFP in that way. Um, and so I think that's really what, Jessica and I have had conversations about that. How do we have people thinking that way? Um, and so look for this upcoming session. I know there are gonna be more proposals um, as to, you know, if a bill does have a funding stream, looking at directing it towards early ed and continuing all of those discussions. There were multiple champions, which is really what you want. You don't want it being, I mean, you know, Tony, the form, former rep Luigi, you know, he knows that if, if you just have one person that's advocating for something, it's easy to get lost, especially in a 105 member house. Um, but if you've got multiple people across multiple committees and multiple subject matters, um, that's really where you build your strength. So I'll use this as a, a play to say, please talk to your representative and senator if, if, you know, when you think about it, about this issue, let them know it's important to you, explain based on your subject matter expertise why it's important, because I think that does go a long way, because we can use as many advocates as we can. and. Uh, Paula Polito has been fabulous in inviting people to her center to see it. Um, Tony Luigi and I had a meeting with somebody who I, I don't think he understood, and I'm not going to say who it was, but I don't think he understood what my modern child care looks like. He had kind of an outdated view of sticking children in front of a television set. Now, everyone around that table knows that is the opposite of what occurs in your child centers. But people need to see that. I mean, you know that, and your parents know that, but somebody that maybe doesn't have school-age children, doesn't have grandchildren that he sees the education side of, so I, I think it's important to get that message out there. We're gonna talk about that a little bit. I know um, some of you had 
uh, noted to us that you wanted to share some of the work that had happened. I want to certainly give space for that. Before we do it, for those that were less in the particulars of session, I'm going to take just a couple minutes to walk through what money was allocated and where did it go so that we're talking about the same dollars, and then we'd love to open that up for a dialogue about what happened, how did that occur, what are the implications for that as we look to year two of the commission. So. Um, the first, there were basically three things funded as part of the state allocation that occurred. The first was for four-year-olds, where as you'll remember, we do very well serving kids. We're at 95% of four-year-olds in need served. Um, there was funding there, there was funding for birth to three, and there was funding for child care rates. I'll talk about each of those. So for four-year-olds, though we do well, for the first time in quite a while, we were going to go backwards on the percentage of four-year-olds served, in part because we had a federal grant, and in part because federal grants go away. That's how it works. And so when that grant was going away, we were going to lose um, uh, roughly uh, 1,800 seats to begin with. We were able to squeeze other programs to try to figure out how to make this happen for some of it, but there was still roughly a 900 child gap that we had, there was no money. So if that money didn't come through, we would have been saying to school systems um, and to sites, we don't have the dollars for your seats. Um, luckily, there was 8.8 .8 allocated that funded those 900 children and includes the amount that we used to cover the others. So it was, I think, roughly 1,800 total, actually, that were covered. Then, in the greatest need and more reflective of this commission's report, uh, there were dollars allocated to Child Care Assistance, or CCAP as it's often referred. You'll remember these are essentially the only dollars that exist in the state, they are almost entirely federal. Um, it's a lot of TANF dollars that cover working or in-school families that have children. It actually goes birth to, I think, age 12, but the vast, vast, vast majority, like for after school, the vast, vast majority are birth to three, as we discussed. Um, and we had at the time about 5,000 families on the wait list. This means these are families who are trying to go to work, trying to go to school, have small children, have jumped through all the bureaucratic hoops of showing that they're eligible for um, this financial uh, support and have a site that they're ready to go to that's ready to accept their child. But we didn't have dollars. We were out of dollars. The federal dollars only go so far, and so we had to start a wait list. This started probably two years ago at this point, Lisa. At the time of session, there were about 5,000 children unserved. Um, we received an additional $8.9 million to fund approximately 1,400 children, um, and about 750 of those are like rolling now. So just as the four-year-old dollars have been um, allocated to the systems to use it to have four-year-old seats rolling right now, the seats that were allocated for birth to three, we immediately processed. Letters went out the last week of June, and we have like have been working overtime to get these families through all the final hoops so that they can use the dollars that exist to have their child in care. I think it is worth saying, though, at the same time that we were able to move those 1,400, um, in the same time that we sent those letters, this is, um, I don't even know the right analogy, but like, it feels like a mountain climber, like you're climbing the mountain and then it's just a machine, you know, because at the same time that we had those um, 1,400 children clear, the minute you tar start talking about the wait list, people are reminded that this is a thing that's available and they realize that perhaps maybe now there's dollars rather than sitting on the wait list for a year like they had been. <coughs> Um, we get a big uptick in applications always because we know the need is so much bigger than 5,000. You all quantified that last year. And we've since that letter had an additional 552 be formally added to the wait list and hundreds more beyond that who are still working on their applications. Which is to say this is certainly a step forward. We are thrilled to provide these families with service and are moving at lightning speed to do it. Um, and it was, I think, for me, a really concrete reinforcement of what this group talked about so much last year, 
which is we just know the need to be so great, particularly for families who are doing everything society asks of them. They are trying to lift their families up out of poverty by going to work and going to school. They have done everything that they're supposed to do, and the reality is the dollars are just limited in that way. The third thing that the dollars went to was modestly increasing the rate for CCAP. You'll remember last year we talked about how not only do we serve a very small number of children, roughly 15,000 per year, but the rate at which we uh, provide the seats is um, relative to the market quite low. This is a problem because the difference between the rate we pay and the rate the center charges, the family of course has to cover. And when that gets to be too big and too large, a family in poverty trying to go to school and to work to lift up out of poverty is not able to make up that difference. And um, so we were obligated to raise that up to at least the 25th percentile. By comparison, this commission last year told us to raise it to the 75th. Um, but we were able to make that change, so the legislature um, and the governor were very grateful, um, allocated an additional 2.3 million to cover that increase to the 25th percentile. In making that change, we created an infant specific rate. It doesn't sound like a big deal, but if you are a child care provider in particular, it is a very big deal, because previously we used to fund infants and toddlers at the same rate, when in reality the ratio for toddlers is bigger, um, and they cost less, as Louise talked about so eloquently last year. Infants are the most expensive to take care of. One, because as a mother who pays a lot for diapers right now, there's a lot of expense there. <laughs> and because there's just fewer of them in the room. And so you have to, you know, the bottom line is just tighter. Um, so we use this opportunity to separate those and to, it's not a big difference, it's certainly not sufficient, but at least to start to acknowledge what you all said so clearly last year, which is the need, particularly at the youngest ages, is at the point of desperate. And this was at least a small step toward trying to right, right the ship there. So you can see how much the rates changed here by age. Uh, these will take effect on September 30th. Um, so our providers will see an uptick in um, the amount of, of uh, state funding that's coming through, and that should make a difference in the pocketbooks of parents as well who are trying to make it. What that doesn't um, cover is about 75% of your goal for last year. So this commission had said that we should be going for 86 um, million. We secured a little under 20. Um, yeah. Excuse me, I have a question. Yeah. On that last slide, why did we go down? I think current and new is switched. That's, oh. It should say new. Uh, it's only like, it's the only the type three. three. Mm -hmm. It's not every every level. Type threes are not going down. No, yeah, we're on take with you slide. Okay. Um, Can yeah, we I think rate? those two are switched. So just it should be 22 and 2250? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, nobody's rate is going down. <laughs> Jessica, can I ask a question? This is Abigail sure. from Trinity Believe in Church. I represent Type 1 centers, I think, and 2 on this committee. But um, is there a reason that the family child care providers saw a 2%, I mean, a $2 increase while the Type 3 learning centers saw roughly a 50 cent increase? Is that a yeah, it's an important question. So, um, and we talked about this quite a bit. So, um, the number of family child cares is very small. I think 170, under 200 in the whole state that are registered family child cares that take families eligible for CCAP. There are probably thousands additional beyond that that don't, but the number that we interact with is quite small. We're working on that. Um, their rate was even further off of the market than um, child cares. So, um, in the market rate survey, actually, it, it was even more. But we took, we have provide we have the provider agreement for every family child care. So we surveyed actually what every single agreement showed us, and went only um, to the 25th percentile of that overall. And the reality is, just the distance between where they were and what actually the market was driving was just bigger. It's a very small number. So actually, the amount of that that's impacting the overall 2.3, which I think was certainly most talked about in response to type three centers. The overwhelming majority of that is going to type three centers where the vast majority of these children are served. 
And the 25% is what's bringing us to the federal regulation where we wrap off. Okay. Thank you. Uh, in-home providers who are shown on here, they are also um, being checked by the class system. They're also going through the class system. They are not. Um, oh, okay. I'm just going to use a different microphone, so I'm going to break that one by the end, y'all. Uh, so right now, the only um, sites that uh, we do class observations for and have ratings for are type 3 centers. So. There's a type one, a type two, and a type three child care in the traditional sense that people think about that. Type three is the sites, represents the sites that take publicly funded children. Um, so of those three, they receive those ratings. Family child cares um, historically have been um, very light touch interaction with the state. And over time, you can see a, a pretty precipitous drop in the number of family child cares that interact with the state at all, whether that's for the food program or for providing services to children. So it used to be in the multi, multi hundreds. Now, as Nasha was saying, it's fewer than 200. I should mention, I, we, we do realize that every provider on this list represents part of the equation of how we serve children with quality. It is just where children are being served, and it is our obligation as a state agency to try to support. Uh, so we are doing um, a pilot with Family Child Cares, led by Susan in the back here. Um, we are piloting this in a couple of regions using um, a small part of the preschool development grant that we earned from the federal government last year to try to re-engage and, and um, understand better what would it mean for Family Child Cares to interact with uh, their lead agency and their community network in the same way that Monique or Paula would, what would it mean for us to provide quality and supports to make sure that, you know, we're getting the best services we can. Uh, we have a lot to learn in that space because it's such a limited group that's interacting with us at all anyway, but we're really, we've had a couple of really great early dialogues with providers um, and eager to learn more about this year, that this year in order to be able to come back to this group and report a bit more. But if, I guess my question is, if they're receiving CCAT students, and so they are accepting public funding in that regard, would it make sense to have them on the same class rating system as our type three sister? Um, they have a very small number of uh, publicly funded children. I The legislation was written so that they were not part of that. I wasn't part of that construction, so I can't speak fully to the, um, the rationale there. But I will say it is different. So one of the things we're exploring in these pilots is what does it look like to measure and coach quality when this is happening often in someone's home with a very small number of children who might be extremely varied in age, whereas like if you went to my child's child care center, my youngest is in a room with children who are just his age at a same <coughs> ratio with a teacher who's focused on that. And so um, I think ideally we would have more to say about quality everywhere in order to help everyone do better in their service of kids. Um, but I think the circumstances are a bit different, so we want to figure out what does that look like and how do you get that right? That, do you think that's within the scope of this commission to look at, or is that something that's going to go through more the Department of Ed to look at? Because I, I understand the differences between the two, but I also think there's value in understanding what's happening, whether it's at an in-home or a family care center. And I mean, everyone who's the subject matter expert is around this table, so don't let me, I'm, I'm just bringing this up. I don't know the answer. I'm, I'm just asking the question. So. Yeah, I mean, I'll say this. I think the pilots this year will be instructive for sure. We have a ton to learn in this space, and um, I think it makes sense to talk about this with this group um, and to see what we've learned and what the implications of are that are for that. I mean, the reality is when you look at you know, when you go back to that chart that shows 173,000 children in need are not getting services, the reality is they are somewhere. Um, and if they're not in a childcare or they're not in a school, in all likelihood they're either with family or that parent can't go to work or school or they are in a family childcare. And so this does represent, in many ways, um, a large portion of the market and um, of service, and we have a lot to learn. Others should certainly jump in. I guess the question I have too is thinking about um, it's exciting to have a 25% um, at the market rate survey, but what does that really mean 
when we're talking about the market rate survey to what it actually costs to care for those children. Yeah, um, percentiles are not everyone's favorite thing to talk about, although I love them. Um, what it essentially means is uh, we used to be at roughly the ninth or 10th <coughs> percentile for big cities. That means when, if, if Stephanie was eligible for CCAP, and I said, okay, you've gone through the process, great. Now you can go to Paula's, I shouldn't use that example. You can, um, that won't make sense. You can go to a childcare. Really, what I'm funding her for only gets her access to one out of 10 centers in the whole city. So 10 percentile, 10 out of 100, one out of every 10 centers. Otherwise, she, there's going to be a difference. And the further it is off of the market average, the bigger that difference. And this is where we started to run into issues last year, right? Where if the, um, if the rate was 2150, but the daily charge was 40, that, that is a big difference for a family that is struggling financially to make up, um, all in the name of trying to get their family to a different place financially. So this now gets us to the 25th percentile, 25 out of 100, so one out of four. Um, it's not perfect, and it's um, more acute in big cities than it is small. So I will mention, um, historically, at the rates we were before, if you were in a small town in Louisiana, we were probably somewhere around the 22nd percentile. We were actually pretty close to 25th because they're charging less. In the city of Baton Rouge or New Orleans, it would have been much more like 9th or 10th percentile because the markets are just bigger and it costs more, right? Um, so one of the things that we have not done yet, but that we were also studying, is what would it mean to go to regional rates? Because the reality is the cost is just different. That's tricky because there's no magic wand that says Melissa's city should cost X and Libby's city should cost Y. So we have a lot more study to do. We're working with some researchers from LSU on this as well. But I do think uh, there are significant differences. We need to address that. And the reality is at this point, we've moved from families being able to access roughly one in 10 centers or one in 15 centers to about one in four centers. I wanted to follow up on that. Um, in a little different vein, knowing, not knowing if we even have enough slots to take care of all the children that we have. Um, but then following up on the idea that the, there are centers who think, well, there's not really any reason for me to accept CCAT because the rate is so low. And so knowing, for example, in Livingston Parish, <clears throat> following the flood of 16, many of those centers just chose not to come back into the network and they're fine. And there's not really, I mean, they're full and it's like, there's no incentive for us. So what can we do then to make sure that we keep that issue in mind? How do we re-incentivize this? Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly others should jump in. There are as many experts around the table as me. Um, I do think rates matter. I think having a wait list is a deterrent. When, that is a deterrent for families to go through the process to sign up. Uh, when they are in poverty and busy and trying to make it to, you know, to turn in a bunch of paperwork and go through the process. And it's a deterrent for providers because, you know, why do I need to jump through additional hoops if the reality is there's no additional seats coming anyway? Um, but I also think it's about uh, a conversation. So in the same way that we had a conversation that many of you led across the street um, with those in leadership who can move the budget, I think it's equally important to be talking to providers of all types. That's part of why we've started re-engaging family child care. It's also why, though, we are re-engaging with type one and type two centers as well. Um, I've said this story many times, so if you've heard it, forgive me, but um, early this summer, or late spring, I had a conversation with the type two provider, and I was asking her uh, why she had chosen not to be type three, and what I expected her to say back to me was, oh, the wait list, or um, I don't want to do X or Y or Z, you know, bureaucratic thing. And what she said back instead was, oh, I thought I was supposed to be type two. Like, I didn't even understand I could be type three. And then when I said to her, but do you realize that comes with tax credits for your staff who are not paid as much as you want to pay them? Do you realize that comes with curriculum supplements to be able to provide better curriculum in class to class? Do you realize that comes with a whole network of people who get together and work on their practice in an instructional way? 
her answer was no, no, and no. And so one of the things that we're also doing is trying to re-engage through a set of focus groups and conversations, type one and type two centers. If they want to be type one and type two, absolutely, they should, that's fine. Everyone can make their own choice. But what I want to make sure of is we've been clear enough as an agency and through our community networks to say, here's what it means to come play in the sandbox as a type three provider. Here's how you do that. Here are the pros and you know, here are the pros and the additional steps of doing that and inviting people in to have that conversation where they want to. It's really important. Jessica? Yeah. I, um, I think what would be helpful, at least for me, coming from a type 1 provider, is um, some kind of document that outlines the variations and licensing requirements between type 1 and 3, um, as well as between type 2 and 3. Because there are some, some um, differences that inhibit type 1 providers specifically from moving to a type 3, for instance for instance, a, a shared space, right? So type one providers are church providers. And so we often share space with our, our church body. So um, although they can all be background checked and all that, I get that. But there are some really specific things that, that are gonna inhibit some type one providers from moving even if they want to. And so um, I would request that we, we um, have someone prepare that document so that we can analyze what are those differences and how can we work to overcome them for those providers? Absolutely agree. And that is part of the conversation we're having. It'd actually be great to connect as well on that. Jessica, if I could, um, just to give some context historically around family child care homes. So Sherry Dorisco, I'm representing the Louisiana Partnership and I'm appointed to this committee on behalf of the governor representing family child care. And so, um, 2008, shall we say, we had about 3,500 child care assistance registered providers. And so it is staggering to hear that we're down to 170. At the same time, there is another system within the Department of Education that registers family homes, and that is the Child and Adult Food Program, which about 10 years ago had somewhere around 6,000 family child care homes. And so those homes, both CCAP and CACFP, can only provide care for six or fewer, including their own. And so, you know, that's the requirement there. Um, to my understanding, and I'm grateful to be serving on the, the task force that you have going right now with family child care homes, there are now 9,000, roughly 8,500 to 9,000 food program uh, uh, registered homes. And so you do the quick math on that and just round it up, say six times, you know, say that 8,000, you're looking at somewhere around 50,000 children that are somewhere that we know about and that we are getting information on them monthly because in order to be paid for the food program, somebody's got to know where you are and what's going on with you. By contrast, if you do the numbers on the CAC, the, the, the child care assistance, 173, whatever it is, I came up with just over 1,000 children. So all of that big picture is to say, there's a huge opportunity for this committee to look at the existing forms of child care. And we know that a lot of families choose the home-based services, our family care. And so right now, we only know where about 9,000 of those family homes are. The rest of them are totally unknown because unless you accept state or federal funds, no one knows who you are and what you're doing. So, Stephanie, Representative Hillary, to your question, yes, that totally falls under the purview of this commission, and I am very hopeful as we look forward that it gives us an opportunity to, to work on that. members had um, raised as well and frankly did the work um, was uh, just when you think about the ask of this group which was 86 million when you think about the dollars secured which is a little under 20 um, and 
uh, how efficiently and quickly we've been able to spend those dollars all in the context of, to go back to the beginning, a system that has proven itself year over year over year to be improving and quite good in general. Um, we wanted to open it up a little bit, um, again, Commissioner Member's asking for this, to talk about um, what it looked like to talk about LA Vega 3 this past year. Um, so where was this shared? How was it talked about? What resources were you pointing to? All of those things. I know Policy Institute wanted to share a few things, but Stephanie, you, you talked about this a bit earlier. Maybe you want to start us off. Just when the legislative discussions were happening, um, how much the birth to three conversation or LAB to three specifically was part of that dialogue and what and all of this in the name of what are the implications for this group as we go into year two we need your direction about how you want to use your your year two platform to continue to move the work forward building on what happened last year addressing gaps that still exist and you know want to learn from this group today so we shape the rest of the meetings correctly Sure. Um, I'll start with a thank you to the, um, the group that put together the numbers on financing the need. And I think, Michael, I think you might have headed up that group. Um, prior to this, and Melanie will remember these discussions, people would say, well, how much money do you need? And um, they wanted it quantified in a dollar figure. And so while we didn't get that dollar figure, um, we got something. We got more than we've gotten seen in a decade. So that's and that's really kudos to all the people sitting around this table and in the back. Um, so I think quantifying the monetary need and then being able to say specifically where that will go um, and in, in showing people that we are serving many of our four-year-olds um, and zero to three is really where the, the greatest need is. That's also when the most brain development, I mean, all of the, all the things were kind of firing at that point, that, that we're not covering children when most of the brain development is occurring. Um, so knowing what the need is from a financial perspective as well as um, you know an approximate number of children and also being able to say specifically um, where we would target those dollars you know when you go in with a plan to the legislature that shows that that background work's been done and that you're not just asking for money and then trying to figure it out on the other side and so I think <coughs> we were able you know as a early ed coalition present a very united front on that side, and I think that's important. And I think moving forward, it'll be making sure that we are looking at our numbers and making sure that the asks are appropriate year after year. So, so there, there were a few opportunities the past year for um, for me to kind of speak to the LAB3 work. Um, one of them was, as Representative Hilferty said, host an early ed day and really allow um, people to into my center to see what it looks like. What does quality care and education look like? And it was kind of interesting in prepping for the early ed day, someone mentioned, oh, well, why don't we have the kids stand up and do a performance? And I said, well, but that's not really how they learn. And that's not really what we want to show off. What we want to show off our children and teachers in the dramatic play area interacting and asking questions. And so it was a wonderful opportunity for senators, legislators, representatives to come in and really see what it looks like. Because we may talk about it, but to see it, like Representative Hill for T said, um, is, is on another level. Uh, another um, opportunity I had was to meet with Michael Hacks at GNO Inc. And he says, yeah, we want this, but you know, I don't understand. I need specific guidance around it. And I said, here you go. Here's this pretty little package. It's called LA Vita 3. So it allowed him specific guidance um, as to what, what we were about, um, really a dollar amount, and what that was going to fund. So um, very helpful in that, in that way. This morning at 7.15, I was with the Jefferson Chamber, the young professionals, um, educating young you know, professionals about what early education looks like, speaking to them about what this LA B to 3 work is, talking about foundation, um, brain development. You know, um, a lot of these um, younger people don't even quite know what that means. I just want a babysitter, but we don't want a babysitter. So um, for me, it's been very helpful beyond talking about the broader piece. Here's some specific guidance as to what it is, what we're looking for, what we're currently doing, and where we want to go with it. So piggyback on Paula. <coughs> so with the Louisiana Policy Institute and working with all of you with the commission, 
we recognize we still have miles yet to go. Like we were so excited about this new investment, but we still need so much more. Um, so we're working with a group to really unify some messaging that we all can share for as a unified voice um, amongst our colleagues, as well as when we're across the street advocating um, for more funds to be able to serve more children. Um, and so we're hoping to have that to the commission to share within the next couple of months and working with the department on that work. Um, additionally, we are, we as the Policy Institute are part of a broader coalition of near, nearly 60 organizations throughout the state, uh, Ready Louisiana. And that work, we've worked really hard with our, our coalition is to really support La Vida 3 and make sure that that's included in um, platform planks for candidates to adopt as a whole of La Vida 3 so that we're not piece and parceling things out but we want them to accept the whole LAB3 plan. And so we've worked really hard, at, hard on that. I know Cindy has worked as well with CCAL too. I just want to add something to that. Um, I just want to say that we sent out something to all our members, asking them to put on an open house, showcase their, showcase their chocolate center. As I meant, and Stephanie, I, I know you going through this right now because Stephanie, you're a candidate for re-election. That's the one she's doing. And, um, you know, as I'm meeting candidates, and I look at the stuff that we're putting out in the messaging, we need a piece of paper that goes before that, like primer, like they don't even know we now call early learning center. They still call it Baker Center. And they don't even know we're the Department of Ed. They don't even know there's Pack 1, 2, and 3. So it's so, um, uh, it's so educational. Uh, last week, we took two legislators through one of our chocolate centers here in Baton Rouge to walk through for two hours and hear early learn centers. But it's more than that. Uh, there's a lot of different delivery options, and let's go look at the license centers. No idea about class and what that means, uh, acronyms. So, so much work to be done. So much work. But, um, we'll get there. So, um, Monique Rouge, um, I'm representing Type 3 centers, and I guess when I think about the work of uh, the LAB to 3 uh, this past session, I would have to say that I've had plenty of conversations with providers, but that's normally what I deal with when you're on the side of um, centers. And basically, I was faced with maybe three things that the providers kind of want to know. Um, I, they're excited about the whole scope. Uh, of course, if it's related to any kind of funding, you know, we get excited. But um, the when, the how, and the sustainability is what, you know, what we face. And plenty of providers would like to know those answers. And I think I did a good job with representing, you know, our um, group to that, but I'm hoping that I could probably gain more knowledge so that I can relate this message to the providers because the one thing that we don't want, and we talked about it earlier, is for high quality centers to pull out. You know, we're actually advocating that they stay in and pull more in. So it's discouraging, but at the same time, it's a bittersweet. And I just, one of the things for this year is to work towards having some type of timeline, I guess, instead of the 10 year, that's kind of scary for them. Um, and just having something a little more concrete and trying to develop a more, and even if this is possible, trying to develop a more unified, sustainable system. This is Marie Blanco. I'm uh, representing the Human Development Center at LSU Health Sciences. And um, I want to piggyback off uh, what Monique was saying. I've spoken to, during the session, I'll speak to a lot of child care providers. And um, I think one of the things that, it's a, a subtly different message, but I think it's important, especially um, thinking about budgeting and going in front of uh, the legislature with an ask. Um, a lot of the child care providers that I talk to are being squeezed out. So they're working very hard to increase their quality. Um, that costs money um, and investment. Uh, and so 
they're working very, very hard to increase the quality of what they're doing, but then they're pricing themselves out of the market where families still have a low CCAP rate and or they're on the That doesn't help put tuition paying families or CCAP, um, families who are accessing CCAP in their centers. So I get calls all the time from providers who are like, I'm doing everything I can to be better, but you know, families are on wait lists and I, don't, I have empty classrooms and I, I have to let teachers go who are invested in. So it's, it's a real challenge when um, we're working very hard to increase, raise the bar, and we're doing a good job with that, but then we're really squeezing out uh, a lot of the top providers. So we're working so hard. Just a quick follow-up question. Marie, is that the case that teachers are not gotten additional certifications and they can then maybe get a job in there? Right, it's a combination of things. One is, yeah, the child care providers are trying to pay their teachers better um, because they are getting additional certifications. They're investing more money in training sometimes. Some of the training comes from the R&R, but a lot of it is, is, comes in other places. Um, and honestly, a lot of the providers that I've talked to are lowering their class sizes and ratios, and, which is awesome. We want that, but it costs a lot more money. And um, so I think parents are, Somewhat more informed, some parents are more informed and they're looking for that quality, uh, but providers are really feeling a crunch when parents get, then can't afford to pay the tuition. It costs more. If I can pay, you know, I'm going to have to charge more to have fewer kids in the classroom, but then the parent can't afford it. So. I think that brings. <laughs> I think that brings up an important point: is that with while we got this increase to a 25 percentile for the market rate value, that still leaves families with a percentage to pay towards childcare, and not all of them can afford that copay, and it makes it inaccessible for them to have high quality care. Tell me, Luigi, uh, I know a lot of you have called me for business. Uh, this song, can you hear me? I want to echo what Cindy said a little bit earlier because we know that so much of this is, all of it is tied into funding. And unless, with so many people coming, new people coming in, unless these new people really understand the issue and get it and know that we've got to find a way to embed funding in the budget, um, we're going to lose our momentum. Last year really was the first year, I think, since probably uh, accountability <coughs> was passed back in 2012 that we've really seen momentum towards funding early care and education. And we, we need to keep that going. We can't let it down. So that's going to be a very important factor uh, over the next over the next several months in particular. Number two, Baltimore's did a really good job with GNO Inc. because I know they're having a meeting which is going to focus on early care and education. I got a call from Ileana on my way here, as a matter of fact, asking me about people to be a part of that symposium. So they're on that. And lastly, what I want to do, Jessica, I want to congratulate the department because when you ask people for money, the next the next question is going to be, well, what, the accountability issue of it and the standards that are, are being imposed. And I think what you're I'm very impressed with the numbers that uh, you came up with and what you all are doing. And that gives us good ammunition when we talk to legislators about getting more money uh, to point out the things that you're doing to ensure the accountability. And so thank you for that and congratulations. So again, the objective was to be able to walk you through what are the latest results themselves, what were the dollars, where did they go, how are they moving, and here a little bit, this was a, a very helpful and instructive conversation for our team about uh, where people feel like there were wins or missed opportunities this year for us to continue working on resources and tools for you all as we move forward. Sure. Um, and anyone on the commission can jump in. This is a good test. Um, 
So LA Beta 3 essentially says um, children in need ages uh, birth to three are our greatest point of crisis to serve in the state. We estimate that two thirds of families are working and so of all the children birth to three in need that we know exist, we estimate at least two thirds of those children need service. That's about 173,000 children. Um, and uh, right now we are serving fewer than 15% of those children across the state. So what this commission did was quantify how much that cost um, at the 75th percentile, not the 25th, because again, you all confronted the rate challenge that we talked about again today, and then said, you know, we recognize a multi-hundred million dollar investment is not going to happen overnight, um, and is certainly not going to happen from one source. So what does it mean to stair step that over time to ramp up service? And um, what does that mean for that to come from a lot of different funding sources? So there's specific acknowledgement at your direction in the report. That this includes local investment, philanthropic investment, state investment, and federal investment. Um, but there was also a specific note last year that said in that first year, your recommendation was that $86 million be a state investment to get the ball rolling on the, the future year stair steps that would come down. Um, again, sort of adding over time to chip away at the gap of children in need. Others should certainly add to that if you feel like I've missed any major headlines, but that's my elevator speech. Hi, thank you. <laughs> Hi, Sarah Hall, I apologize for coming late. Um, really appreciate what you just said and I, I think we've, we've had this conversation before about how the needs that are going to be met look different depending on where you are in the state. I, I know that a, a rural district uh, the focus may not be on the two-thirds of the working parents but that, that's not the case in a lot, large part of my district but the need is still there for the children to be ready for kindergarten so I, I see this as an opportunity to meet a lot of needs economically, educationally, with uh, our future workforce, and, and, and just giving uh, resources to parents that don't have them now. They, they don't have that, that place to go. So uh, I, I think there, there's, if we, if we, and I've heard this uh, with economic influencers in the state, they, they see the role of B to three as an economic, more of an economic development extension and it's so much more than that so I, I feel that we can't you know we can't narrow that because we're, we're missing a lot of opportunities uh, to improve our state in a lot of ways so thank you thank you all for what y'all done Jackie. I kind of wonder thinking through this because um, when we look at that zero to four is what we're talking about it's a four-year period and it kind of bookends nicely with the college period and it's just kind of getting people to think about this is not something you put the child in one year and then you don't put the child in the next year. I mean, we would never say that from second to third grade. Like, my kid went to second grade and then didn't go to third grade. Like, that, I mean, that's, no, but I mean, but with B to three and, and, and you know, into the fourth year, I think we need to have and, and try to, in our language, <coughs> get the same narrative. That this is just being in a one-year-old room and then a two-year-old room is the same thing as a second grade to a third grade classroom. Um, and if anything, there's probably more developmentally that's occurring from that one-year-old room to the two-year-old room. And so I think, because my biggest, um, I guess the thing that, that gives me heartburn is how we maintain funding for early ed, um, for the, the children that are currently being served, and then also increase funding, and we don't backslide such that we're funding fewer slots. And I, I think that's where I'm, why I'm saying, you know, we would never think of saying, okay, you went to second grade, you don't go to third grade, you know, two-year-old room to three-year-old room. Just, I don't know, something to think about and how we frame these discussions, that, that the early ed, zero, one, two, three, four, is not um, something where you skip a year or, you know, but in many instances, that's the reality for families, so. Uh, that is a good lead-in to us transitioning to year two, which is really part of one big discussion, but technically a separate agenda. I also think we need to do another receipt motion, and then we'll just transition right in. Sure. I'd like to make a motion to receive um, information on consideration of updates on priorities for year two of the Early Childhood Care and Education Commission. Okay. Second. Second. Thank you all. 
Great. So just to jump right in, and hopefully this language looks familiar, although maybe you haven't read it in a while. Last year, one of the things we talked about in this group was, of course, there's just so much to talk about in this space. What did you want to sort of wait in year two to cover? Year one, we really focused on how many kids and at what rate, and what does that mean to chip away? In year two, you told us last year uh, that you were really looking for a focus on four major priorities. The first of which is locally driven decision making. I'll talk about that in a second. Second was um, quality, really thinking about what does it mean uh, per Beth's point to support all families in whatever type of care or not they're in. After <coughs> affordability and access, so this was about essentially squeezing every dollar we have, and I'm gonna give you a bit of an update on that piece today. Um, and then for public awareness and collaboration, so how is it that we achieve what Cindy and Libby and Tony were talking about before, of the sort of mass education that needs to happen to, to have people engage in the system and support it, but also fund it. Um, we talked a little bit about that today. I imagine, frankly, that will be a theme for this group in every meeting moving forward. On the first point, I watched, let me just transition to this. The way we have currently drafted to talk about these, and we can absolutely change this, you should provide this direction, but we tried to pencil in a version of this to sequence conversation, um, is we have really mapped for, um, in our first, our second meeting to follow, a real focus on the locally driven decision making. Ready Start Networks, which are essentially the next version of community networks, which are those groups that are bringing everybody together, saying where are we getting it right, where do we have opportunity, what does it look like to have a plan in Jefferson Parish for one year, three years, five years from now, what does it look like to have a Ready Start Baton Rouge plan that says what the city is going to do for kids birth to five in the next one to ten years. Um, we have 13 of those now up and running. We just released our second cohort's um, names yesterday. <coughs> We're incredibly proud of the communities that have raised their hand. And frankly, I think there is a lot to discuss here. I imagine, um, unless you all have a different direction for us, meeting two, we need to spend a very healthy portion of time talking about this. To preview for you why I think we need to do that, when you think about solving um, continuing to drive quality in the way that we talked about at the beginning of the meeting, the nuances of who's struggling and where they're struggling is different in refugees than it is in EDR, than it is in Terrebonne, and we have found in all things education, positioning and supporting those locally to drive that change is best for kids. So Ready Starts are doing that. Um, they are learning and figuring out this work with us. I want to talk to you about what it looks like for them to have a plan for access to quality and to drive toward that in the coming years. They are also, though, really interesting coalition and funding builders. It is just true that like, when I think about my neighbors that do or do not understand what I do every day at work, they are much more compelled by me or a, a colleague who's from the community saying, here's the current state of play in EDR, here's where we need to head, and here are ways that you can help support that, then like, here's a state agency speaking for the whole state. It's <coughs> just not compelling, nor do we in our very tiny staff represented at this table have the capacity to wholesale drive the full scope of what we need to do. As we said, this is going to take all players at all levels. So um, we would like to spend the next meeting going much deeper on Ready Starts. Where are they? Cohort one is clearly much further than cohort two, given they're just starting. But what are we asking them to build? What is that looking like? What are we learning along the way? What are they learning along the way? And what are the implications for those as we look forward? You know, I'm feeling increasingly optimistic that not only do I think if we get this right, they could be uh, groups that build a plan that a community rallies behind that helps to get more funding, but also can really become the hub that we always imagined for early services beyond the scope of just actually education. So we've been having a lot of really great conversations with LDH. They have been incredible partners to us this past year, to ongoing, but in particular this past year, to think about as Ready Starts become more robust, how can we use enrollment events or communication events to help share resources that exist in a whole facet of ways for families um, that just represent such a more robust set of services for children birth to five that is just really exciting to think about the future of Louisiana in the context of that. So we'd like to talk about that. Second, um, 
As I mentioned before, I think the public awareness and collaboration, whether it's specifically discussed or not, is the undertone of all of this. This commission is tasked with coming up with what is this plan and what does this look like. We'll probably need to talk about that every time. But Policy Institute is working in particular to build a more robust toolkit around LA Vita 3, so we would like to spend some time allowing them to share that and get the group's feedback about whether or not that's giving you what you need to have the conversations we just discussed. Um, and then in November, we'd like to um, reconvene again to talk about um, the broader scope of uh, funding this, as well as the broader scope of um, quality. So for, there are many different sort of strategies about how it is that we either expand the network of individuals that are working with community networks, a la our conversations about family child care or inviting type one and type twos to be more involved. Um, but also, there are families that choose and want to have their child at home. And what can we do to make sure that every adult that's interaction, interacting regularly with small children understands that 90% of brain development is happening in those young ages? understand what it means to have engaging conversations and how important language is to that development. Um, there are a number of states that have started this work. We are learning as much as we can about those, and we'd like to present back to you what we've seen in other places that has or hasn't worked to provide a broader set of resources so that as we think about the set of services we provide, whether I am formally in a program or not, there are resources that exist in the state of Louisiana to help us do right by all kids and get them the services and supports they need, again, to be kindergarten ready. I do think we'll probably need work groups throughout, um, so we may ask of a smaller group of you to help us do some writing again, um, but then we'll convene again in January for you all to say, okay, given what happened in year one, given where the state of the market is, given the conversations we've had this year. Here's how we want you to tweak the report from last year, overhaul the report from last year, supplement the report from last year. We'll need your direction along the way about um, the position this group wants to take in year two. Uh, before I jump into the shared services, um, I'm curious if folks have any immediate reactions on any of those four not seeming right, something seeming missing, or a desire to have a different set of conversations than I just named. Um, you should feel free to send feedback after as well, but if you have immediate thoughts, we'd love to hear them. Thank you. I have um, just a couple of thoughts. One is, as we look to the Ready Start Networks, I would be particularly interested in to the extent they have even had conversation about engaging family child care homes. Sure. I think also that uh, it's becoming clearer to me that when we have this 173,000 number that we need to reach, we know where some of those kids are already. And so that might mean that the department needs more capacity in order to bring those centers or, or those family homes into some type of a stronger oversight. So it might mean that you need staff as a part of what we're talking about you know, for this discussion. I think that's really important to, for us to keep our head around. Uh, and the other thing is, last time, as I remember, we put about a million dollars in to focus on services for parents and resources. And Senator Mondale, I remember, we talked specifically about home visitation in the rural areas and, and you know how that can help families. And so, as I look across the country and when I see other folks doing things around the early care, it's not just seats in a child care center. It's looking broader at the home visitation, the infant early childhood mental health system. So how do we weave those things into our conversation? Or is that our role? Maybe, maybe I'm expecting too much, but just wondering what your thoughts are. Yeah, that was a more eloquently stated way of um, what I think we need to talk about. I actually think it'll probably come up in both the September and the November meeting, given the topics. Um, again, I'm just really grateful to LDH for their continued partnership with, and actually Policy Institute helped us secure a grant that's helping facilitate all <coughs> sorts of planning cross-agency. Um, but I think that there are, the more robust and known and organized and funded and structured Ready Start is, the more likely I think it is that you have 
obvious local entities through which to elevate, expand, support all of the types of services you just named. So that whether I am um, going to a child care or not, or keeping my child at home, or need, you know, uh, a visiting uh, nurse to come, you know, help me through those early phases of uh, both late pregnancy and early motherhood, um, we will have more robust networks locally that I think it's interesting to think about how those two things relate together. There's a lot to figure out, but I think it bumps on both, right? What does it mean for state agencies as we think about, you all did put a million dollars last year that you proposed toward, you know, a website and resources and supports for all families. And what does that mean locally as these institutions sort of get more robust to have them be a hub for that? That doesn't mean they need to be the deliverers of all of that, but as the, the group that knows the most about what exists to help families and children birth to five, you can imagine some really incredible partnerships happening there. I'll be really quick. I, I think what we're all wanting to see is a child's quality of life. And I, I think to think that one, one tunnel is going to lead us to the light is, is not fair to the problems our children have in this state. And I, I, absolutely, you, you are so right. I don't have a park in my town. How sad is that? So. With <laughs> <laughs> that, we're going to wrap it up. <laughs> I have nothing to add to that. That was perfect. Um, now I will move on to a topic about saving money. So, thank you, Beth. That was really helpful. So, I, I do want to give you just a brief overview here. We can include some language in the report if you'd like. And we have done this largely at the direction of the commission. But um, I have to give a shout out to Emmy O'Dwyer, who has both helped convene this group and also at the same time spearheaded this work in so many ways. And I am fired up about it. Um, Quick reminder, why do we need to do shared services and why do we need to think about squeezing dollars? Well, in addition to there not being enough dollars for seats, it is just true, as we discussed last year, that in particular, early learning centers often really struggle to meet their bottom line. That has been a theme today and all of last year. That's because they're typically standalone. That is because they, in Louisiana in particular, are very small. You'll remember us saying last year when our national experts came in and started looking at our data, they literally thought our data was wrong because it couldn't possibly be that all these centers were running so small. Most centers typically aim to be about 100 kids or bigger. That is way above the average in Louisiana. And that smaller scale just results in inefficiencies, frankly, that are really complicated to manage from a business perspective. I think we're in like the 50 to 70 range uh, in terms of, license capacity. of the total kids who are there. I, I would have to look it up. Yeah. Exactly. It's, exactly. It's, it's like our small parishes or rural hospitals. You know, the scale gets complicated in the rural parts of our state. Absolutely. There are high overhead costs. So again, we talked about last year. Um, you'll remember Luis gave that really incredible presentation that talks about why do child cares need four-year-olds, for example. They need four-year-olds because a four-year-old class is financially viable. An infant class is not. And the reason you see so many child cares that don't offer services until one or one and a half is because they cannot afford to do it. And so, you know, and yet we're all sitting around this table saying the greatest need in the state is birth to three. That's not a mistake. Those things are related. And then, of course, price-sensitive families. We are a, a rich state in so many things, but not always in money. And it is true that we have a lot of struggling families. Um, so making that work is complicated. So we've done a lot to try to help, in particular, directors on their bottom line. I'll walk through some of these briefly. I and mean, you should certainly jump in if I miss anything. This is her work. And I'm so grateful for it. The first thing we did, which actually is a bill that CCAL and probably legislators around this table passed a number of years ago, there is a process through which school systems can buy into state contracts. I realize now this is sounding much less exciting than everything we discussed before, but it really matters. Big state contracts result in much reduced prices. And the reality is for years, child care centers have actually had access to this, but it wasn't widely publicized. And as sometimes happened in government processes. It was complicated. Emmy has worked very hard with CCAL and our procurement office to demystify this and to make it so that 
um, child cares can access these discounts. We did a bunch of trainings this summer with directors. We created a simple page, a form that's filled out for them. And this saves them money on everything from printers to buses to paper to milk. Um, all of which helps their bottom line so that again, I realize this feels around the margins given the scope of what we're talking about, but day to day can be the difference between centers opening and closing, which has the ripple effect of kids do or don't get service. Is this for any center or is it type three? This is any center. Mm -hmm. We have the most interaction with type threes obviously, but any center is eligible and we're promoting this through every venue that we have. So they sign up through Department of Ed Department of Administration. Okay. So on the Louisiana Belief, there's literally a page called Saving Money Through State Contracts. You can put that in the search bar and it'll pop up all of the steps, including how you become eligible. And we're working to make it easier. We're getting feedback. And also, state procurement is, you know, if there's a need at mass, they can also put out bigger bids. And so we're working to make sure that it's addressing the biggest financial needs people have as well. The other um, set of things we're doing through a set of pilots are uh, first and most discussed substitute teaching pool. Again, I realize this is very specific and in the weeds compared to the rest of this conversation, but also really matters. So when you, when I was an eighth grade math teacher, if I was sick, I called Kelly Services and somebody showed up and my coworkers were not curious me the next day when they had to cover my classes all day, right? In a child care center, that is often not the case. I have many mornings walk my children in and there's the, oh my gosh, Miss Susie's gone today, scramble, where people are trying to figure it out, right? And so we are building a couple of tools to figure out what does it mean to have regional or local substitute teaching pools so that if Monique has a teacher out, there is an automatic process for how you make that happen. Um, you know, the scale is different, so it's more complicated, but we're, uh, we've had a couple of pilot regions sign up. We're hoping to learn a bunch of lessons from that, figure out if any regulations need to be changed, and scale this as a reliability solution for the whole state. We are doing the same thing with administrative staff. So often our smaller centers struggle to be able to do books, paperwork, all the, all the things, you know, when they're trying to focus on making sure classrooms are instructionally sound places. And then in general from all of this, doing licensing focus groups and work with our directors to understand where do we still have too many regulations that perhaps don't advance the health and safety or instruction of kids, but do get in the way of those things happening. We certainly want to know that and fix it. That's an ongoing lesson and exercise for us generally. We are also creating um, a set of toolboxes for uh, directors so that they're not spending time recreating interview questions or processes, just things that eat up time when you are a small business that can be created. And if they want to use it, great, they don't have to, but we hope it saves uh, time and energy at scale here as well. Amy, would you add anything that I've missed? No. Again, I really, I cannot um, commend Amy enough for all the work that's gone into this and for the directors that have helped us. This is. I think the start of a role of a set of things that need to happen. But again, I hope what you take from this is less the, specific, the specifics and more we are an agency that takes very seriously our obligation to spend every dollar as smart, as tight, as wise as we can. And we view it as our full responsibility to make sure that when our providers are struggling, whether that be on class or be on interviews or be on substitutes, it's our job to help them figure that out, um, which is why we put energy and some of our grant funding behind this. Yes. Um, I just want to say, um, I just want to say that I'm so excited about all the work that Emmy has done. Um, one of our members said, should I, this is something different, that's the Leadership Academy. But they said, should we apply for this? Because it's a small pilot. And um, I said it was developed by Harvard University, which are downside. So I can't wait to see the list of people in the Academy that um, Emmy put together too. But, um, it, on my time hop, it popped up this week that five years ago, this week, we were in the ceremony with Bobby Jindal for the bill signing ceremony, for the bill that we passed five years ago. And I tell people all the time, and Tony knows this better than Stephanie and Beth, better than anyone in this room, you can pass bills all day long <coughs> and twice on Sunday. It doesn't matter unless they're enforced. Well, the navigation of the law that we passed was so unwieldy that nobody could ever <coughs> 
to say things. So they'd go and they'd try to figure it out and they'd throw their hands up in the air and give up. Emmy took the initiative to go to Office of State Partnerships and link their website to something that childcare providers can go in and put, I'm looking to buy milk. Okay, it's gonna pop up board and client feeder and a few other things. Milk, and lots of milk. We have milk cows in your district. So, you know, so they're gonna now be able to just call those folks and, uh, and get uh, pricing so they can save money. So I'm really excited and I wanna commend Emmy. She's done a fabulous job. Sorry, Jessica, but I like to share. <laughs> and I know that we jumped over the removing policy barriers, yeah. but I, I do want to make sure that um, that includes licensing, which is one of my favorite things. Just to give you all an example, we are in the, the Ready Start um, pilot in Washington Parish, and I'm so proud uh, that we are part of that. And we're putting a three-year-old Head Start classroom in the elementary school where they had an empty room. And so just the hoops that we have jumped through, not me so much as Washington Parish Schools, to get that classroom licensed that's in a building that was built in the 60s probably, never been licensed, and so just the stuff that, oh yeah, we gotta cover up that. Oh yeah, we gotta, so, um, Anyway, yay, I can't wait to hear the things that are changed uh, to help facilitate <coughs> that. Um, I, I want to go ahead and um, echo <coughs> Susan. Um, Lisa is amazing, and I know with the help um, that she's going to give child care providers, she truly wants the best for us. And it's quite the struggle. Um, I service over 200 families. And you can imagine the number of critical accident reports I have to send in and um, paperwork and just struggles. I want to have conversations about the best for every kid. I want to have conversations about instructional support and emotional support and kindergarten readiness. And it becomes very difficult to have those conversations when you are pushed down and kept under because of some red tape issues. So I am very excited about focus groups and um, ways we can improve that relationship because if we talk about what class is grounded in, it is grounded in relationships and I believe we can begin to ground our work with licensing and child care centers in relationships and we can move forward for the first time in a very, very long time. Um, Mo Moni, go ahead, you had something. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to say, um, as it relates to the licensing issues, um, if we can just find a better way to get our license. I'm trying to open up a new center, a quality center, and I've been ready, and I'm just waiting for them to come out to approve me because I have children ready to come on in. So that would be so helpful, and I'm not the only one. There's several different entities to this game, and I'm in different levels. And I'm just trying to say that this one, this one should be easy. Yeah, we, um, so uh, all of the operations team has um, moved to my team in recent time, and I'm really excited to work with the whole team. I will say it's been, it's certainly been a, um, a learning opportunity for me, and that team has been very gracious with me uh, during that process. I, it's interesting, you know, there's been this, in the past month, real wave of, as makes sense, right? So everybody's going back to school. There's suddenly this like mountain of sites that want to open or need to change or what have you. And so, one of the things we're thinking about is what does that mean in in work that can be really insanely busy or steady pace and there's variance. And you know, we have the staff. We have. How do you adjust and maneuver there to um, to play defense and offense and get people open? Because that's certainly our objective. Um, I don't think we've gotten it all right, but I work, I'm fully clear that I work with the team 100% committed to that, and we appreciate the feedback. We want to get better at it over time, and really looking forward to the focus groups and conversations this fall so we can keep it moving forward. All right, so just a reminder, um, our next meeting is slated for September 19th. Um, if you have feedback on topics we didn't discuss today and you were feeling a little shy, you didn't want to say to the whole group, certainly feel free to send me feedback or the team. 
Um, otherwise, we will keep the work moving. Um, and I just want to say again, I, you know, I left this group last January optimistic about the direction of the state. I am thrilled that we ended the session with additional dollars for early childhood. But I also know we have so much more to do. Um, and it was re-motivating re to hear the conversation today. So looking forward to continuing those dialogues. We do, before we close, have public comment. Um, I really want to remember um, Governor Kathleen Blanco today. Um, for those of you who don't know, Governor Blanco did so much, not just for pre-K programming, but also for children first through three. And you know, this was following Katrina. Um, we were the 15th state in 2007 to develop a quality rating system. It was voluntary. It was totally focused on the social emotional needs of children, which was unlike any other rating system in the country. That was all under her leadership. In 2007, part of her um, Part of her package that session included the school readiness tax credits that to this day are, you know, the envy of the nation. And it was her leadership and her guidance that made that happen. Um, you know, we got $14.4 million in this state to help rebuild child care on both sides of the state from Katrina and Rita. And again, that was her leadership that did that. We put mental health consultation into early care, and that was her leadership. And so, as we think of her, for so many of the accomplishments that she has done, I just really wanted um, to presence her today and to remember her um, as we do this work. Uh, we'll open it up for public comment, and I have one card from Melanie Bronson, called the Institute for Children. Thank you. I put that in just for us early, without <laughs> the notion of thinking I might by now, and of course I do love to have the comment. I want to emphasize, Siri and I are probably the two in the room who were around at that time, and uh, working in this space, and she said it more eloquently than I did. In fact, our newsletter, Libby and I were just grouping um, uh, talks, our, our headline is about Governor Blanco. There's been so much wonderful uh, press remembering her, but that she had a huge legacy in early childhood, which has not been mentioned. And so we of all people should remember her in that way. Um, she doubled the number, also, I was going back and researching, she doubled the number of pre-K class at that time. Um, in, in addition to the fact it was under her leadership, that figure we say almost 40,000 pre-cap class, that was under Governor Blanco and now we're down to the numbers that we have today. So she just, between quality as well as access, she jump-started our state and really got us going to where we could be where we are today. So I get goosebumps, she was a wonderful leader and, and that's certainly part of her legacy. So Sherry, Sherry, in fact, she created your position at the time, which <laughs> Sherry became our leader, but, but even then it was childcare and it became the quality rating system and all the infrastructure around quality that Sherry led and got it all started, so thank you to everybody. But the other thing that I didn't hear said, and maybe I just missed it, was um, in the discussion about the need to, to educate, we didn't talk, I don't think, about the election, which of course is first and foremost gonna happen. We talked about the new legislators needing to know early childhood. Well, the best thing to do in terms of getting them to commit is before they're elected, get it on their platforms so that they then we have you know hit the ground running with a promise they've already made and so um, i just wanted y'all to all know that libby our new executive director dr sonia netto will be doing on wednesday um a um, and i'll let her i'm grabbing for her but she can talk about a webinar to educate candidates uh, please talk to her or me about signing up anyone you know advocates are also welcome it's to get information to candidates about again 
we're a nonprofit college receive, so we just educate all candidates, we don't make decisions, but it's critical to each of us that any time we have the opportunity that a candidate progresses to the legislature, to the governor, to the governor's office, that we ask them, what is your position on early care and education? And we say to them, there, LAB is three, the message. There are, you know, we have made huge strides, but there is a huge need. And I would emphasize working families because that everyone gets that. And the need for early childhood, this is our job, that is the advocates and all of us as citizens right now to educate anyone we can. Go to forums, ask that question of the candidates. Um, anytime anyone knocks on your door, any debate that you're part of, and you can you know, give the questions to the people asking the questions for every legislation, legislation every seat of the legislature is up. It's critical we get them on the record now saying, I care about this, I'm willing to invest in this. We can fill in the details later. <laughs> right now, just get them to commit and understand they care about what the voters care about. We're the voters. We got to let them know. And our parents and our child care providers and our teachers, they all need to hear it. The other thing is for our candidates that have supported it, we need to thank them in those forums and all and you know, make sure that it was something we cared about and we appreciate the fact that they were leaders on those topics. So that's my two cents worth. We're sorry, but I can't help myself. <laughs> and we have a website on our Take Action page. We have, at the Policy Institute for Children, we have a whole series of um, one-pagers to help you. Like it says, it's a platform, it's a platform that a candidate can adopt of what they, why they should do it, background information, polling showing that a majority of voters of every persuasion in every region of the state, according to this poll, which was actually by a Republican pollster from Texas, that the voters care, like the voters, very much care about this issue. So it's just really important for us to get that word out and do this. If I may, uh, lobbying does include in its questionnaire questions on early oh, ads. Great, tell me, thank I'm you. Sure, Representative Bill Purdy and, and Senator Mizell and that. So, Yes, we were including that. Go, Tony, go. Thank you. <laughs> Um, well, Melanie, thank you so much for your work. I know you're retired, and I'm so happy to see you sitting up there. <laughs> retired. <laughs> retired in air quotes. Uh, I will put it. She's uh, not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Just so, but thank you so much. And uh, Melanie, I have seen her at coffee shops talking to candidates about the very same thing <laughs> in the flesh. <laughs> um, if that is all for public comment, we will we'll close public comment. Um, I think you have two more time. Yeah, I, um, just the next meeting. Oh, okay. Well, there's the next meeting. December 19th, 2019. Um, and do I have a motion to adjourn? Thank you, everyone. Bye.